I would like to present some of our data concerning your yeah, chemically complex alloys, how you create them, how you can ma manipulate phases, microstructures, and of course, at the end of the day, in our case here for the moment, uh, the mechanical properties. This could also hold for functional properties, for instance, magnetic properties. And as you can see from the title page, this is of course uh, an ongoing work that we perform since quite a lot of years with a lot of people involved from all over the world. And we have support through different funding agencies in Europe, in Austria, uh, and also quite some link with a lot of friends over in China. Uh, that come over via CAC stipend programs, for instance. So what is the motivation? The motivation is if we talk about mechanical properties that you want to have, of course, uh, something like high performance materials. This could be done with respect to the fracture toughness, to the strength, to the ductility, etc. And you have typically then such kind of Ashby maps that simply tell you, okay, for which kind of toughness values you would like to have for its specific elements. Our background developing such advanced materials is usually somewhere in the area of metastable materials. So this could be amorphous systems, would be roughly in this sketch here in this corner. And over the last years, we also spent a lot of work merging, let's say, something like amorphous systems with high entropy alloys with quite, quite complex microstructures. And the idea at the end of the day is always to have something that can overrule something like this old competition between strength on one end and very limited ductility on the other end. So you want to have something at the end of the day that goes in this direction, like this arrow, red arrow here, simply indicates <coughs> that you would like to have simultaneously a high strength, a high mechanical stability, plus a good deformability if you want to shape something, for instance. And for this, you can go in totally different directions. This means you can either go in a direction where you say, okay, I want to have a high strength material, so I refine grain sizes, I add additional precipitates. You can play with ultra fine grain structures, single phase, bimodal distributions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can go a little bit in a different direction. You can play, for instance, with metallic glass forming systems, composite structures, where you have, for instance, a glassy matrix plus reinforcing phases, typically in this case, then for ductility enhancement. Or you could drive the system in a direction that may be going in direction of high entropy alloys, again, either single phase or composite structures. In all these cases, you can, of course, always try to modulate and tune volume fractions of phases, the size of, for instance, precipitates. You can also talk about interface modulation, where you may tune specific types of interfaces, for instance. This looks a little bit like if these things would be more or less detached from each other, would go in totally different directions. But if you think in terms of, let's say, something like a pseudo ternary phase diagram, then you see easily that if you simply vary and modify the compositions in a given phase space that you can either that's denoted more or less with this red marked area here for instance something that has an amorphous phase or develops an amorphous phase or it could be a mixture of amorphous plus crystalline phases or if you go along these directions here for instance you would have for instance then something goes in a direction of high entropy alloys. So the message from this slide is already, of course, there is a widely open phase space, typically in the middle or coming to the middle of pseudo ternary phase diagrams. Of course, this is a little bit trial and error because at the end of the day, you cannot really map out all the phase variations that may be possible in here. But in principle, all these different structures are in one or the other way somehow related if you modify, for instance, the composition. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, this sketch should simply give you an idea about a CCT diagram. And of course, if you come from the melt and quench at different cooling rates, for instance, you may either have the chance for a given composition uh, 
to form something like a single phase glass if you quench fast enough to bypass the nose here. Or if you quench slower, you may hit the nose and may have a combination of an amorphous matrix plus whatever crystalline phases, typically metastable phases that you would expect from the phase diagram at a high temperature region, or you could have it fully crystalline. Alternatively, you could also do it the other way around and could say, okay, let's quench fast enough, bypass the nose, make something amorphous, and then reheat it either with a constant heating rate or heat it up to a given temperature, sit there isothermally, and let's precipitate a second phase. So what I want to tell by this is basically you have a lot of different parameters that you can adjust for creating quite complex metallic microstructures. Could be single phase, could be composite structures. This means just schematically shown in this slide here or this picture here that you can have, for instance, an amorphous matrix with crystals with different size, different shape, can be dendritic, can be primary crystals, can be eutectic phases, depending on the exact composition that you have. Could even be something a little bit more exotic, like phase separating systems, where at the end of the day, you have a microstructure comprised of two different amorphous phases that coexist. So this is a little bit the scenario behind it. And what I would like to do in the next couple of slides is to guide you a little bit, let's say through this kind of phase space and show what you can get and how you can tune the mechanical properties at the end. So let's simply start with something that maybe, again, this picture here, maybe something in this area here in this red marked area where you would expect from the composition from the underlying thermodynamics that you may form an amorphous phase. And indeed, for some of the compositions, like you can see here from the X-ray patterns, you form an amorphous structure. If you move in the phase space to a little bit different compositions, of course, you may have a competition with the crystals. So you may have either fully glassy material, or you may have something that competes with relatively complex crystalline phases. Depending where you are, you're marked by the different symbols. But I hope you can see, okay, depending on the composition, maybe single phase amorphous or maybe a kind of composite structure. The fun part of this glassy structure is that it has a so-called relatively wide super good liquid region. So this means that that's basically the temperature region like marked here for the arrows between the glass transition temperature and the crystallization temperature here. This peak denotes the crystallization into the competing crystalline phases. And if this region here is something like 50 to 100 K, then it gives you a temperature regime where you can easily shape such a glassy structure, more or less like a, like a polymer. Uh, so you can easily do some shaping operations uh, in the supercooled liquid region which is quite attractive if you want to have, for instance, shaping of relatively complex parts. On the other end, the problem with these amorphous systems is typically that they may be quite strong. So for such cobalt-based alloys, it's not unrealistic to expect, depending, of course, again, on the composition, uh, strength values of, let's say, 3,000, 4,000, even up to five or 6,000 MPA. So you have a very high, a very strong material at room temperature. But unfortunately, as you can see, there is basically no ductility. The escape route for the shaping, as I said, is shaping in the super cold liquid region. But nevertheless, these materials are relatively brittle. They have almost no plastic deformability at room temperature. This is something you have to keep in mind. This is called typical for a glassy structure. Uh, I'm going to skip the right hand part a little bit, which basically just shows you, okay, you can easily understand why these compositions form a glass depending on atomic size ratios, depending on electronegativity values, etc. Uh, but this is not important for the moment. The problem, as I said, is the material is strong, but unfortunately very brittle. So you can tune the composition in a little bit different way and can go in a direction where it's at the end of the day a fully crystalline material. So you can 
uh, that's determined by the underlying thermodynamics, move away from this fully amorphous structure to something that is a very fine scale or a relatively fine scale eutectic structure, where you have competing crystalline phases here, like for instance, this gamma cobalt structure, this FCC structure coexisting with rhombohedral crystals, as you can see from the X-ray patterns, and as you can also see from the morphology of these SEM pictures here, that you have a quite characteristic eutectic microstructure where these two different phases coexist. This is something you can trigger if you add a little bit more copper, for instance, copper acts as a nucleant for these phases and more or less promotes this primary precipitation of gamma cobalt and refines the intermetallic phases. So you can play again when you adjust fine tune and adjust the composition with a solidification microstructure you may get for a given processing condition. And this is the result in terms of the, of the strength and ductility values. So again, if you modulate and fine tune the composition with these copper additions, for instance, you can see, okay, you sacrifice something in terms of the strength level compared to the glass. So you just reach something like 2,500 MPa, but you gain a lot of, a lot of ductility in there. So switching from the single phase glass to something like these eutectic structures may be one route uh, to prevent catastrophic propagation of shear bands, which gives you a combination of quite high strength values and good ductility. So this is one way of thinking, or call it, if you wish, a kind of cooking recipe, if you want to induce something like ductility. Of course, like you can also already see from the, from the TM images here, you have a quite characteristic eutectic microstructure. You have to worry about the interfaces. You have to worry about the dislocation activity that you induce in there, how the dislocations interact with the different phases, how they interact with the interfaces. And this itself would be a talk to give a lot of more details probably, but I just want to show this slide here, which more or less should perhaps indicate a little bit that you have a lot of different dislocation activity. You have multiple slip. You can also have deformation twins in there. Uh, you have the interaction of shear bands besides dislocations with these lamellar interfaces. And the interfaces themselves are quite important because they are basically the sources where you can accommodate local stress peaks, local deformations, uh, and this at the end, if you tune the interfaces right, may give you like sketched, roughly sketched here in this image here, different mechanisms that become active at different degrees of deformation, which more or less spread or prevent localized deformation and spread the deformation relatively evenly or homogeneously throughout the material. So the trick here is not just to make the microstructure more complex, but to also induce and trigger different deformation mechanisms that take over at a given stress level, for instance, and counteract the otherwise observable brittleness. You can go one step further and can say, okay, if I have something like such eutectic structures, is this perhaps also possible for high entropy alloys? And indeed it is, again, just some snapshots along this line. So again, there's now an iron-based system. If you make the composition relatively complex, you have here in this case, again, not a single phase material, but you basically have an FCC structure coexisting with some intermetallic phases like shown here. That's a characteristic microstructure for something like this. Uh, if you then look a little bit deeper and also think about what is perhaps a higher stability at higher temperature. So if you do some annealing treatment, you see, of course, that there are changes, there are phase transformations. For instance, the amount of these FCC dendrites, these bright areas here increases upon annealing. The eutectic structures that you have may decompose, they may coarsen. There may be a lot of redistribution of the solute elements sometimes even segregating to the grain boundary. So what you basically do upon this annealing treatment is that you induce 
some kind of phase transition plus a transition from more or less a relatively uniform microstructure to a kind of quasi-duplex microstructure. Uh, what this leads to at the end is that either through composition variation plus adjustment of quenching conditions plus annealing, subsequent annealing, you can tune the mechanical properties in a large direction. So you can have, in all these cases, relatively high strength. And if you have a closer look for the deformation curves, I think it's quite obvious that you can induce even more pronounced ductility. You may lose and sacrifice at a higher annealing temperature some of the yield stress here, for instance. But you have a quite extended region where you have pronounced work hardening. In a lot of cases, this pronounced work hardening, I'll show you an example in a minute, uh, comes from phase transformations, from something like twinning or transformation-induced plasticity effects that counteract otherwise possibly happening shear localization. So what you want to have in a lot of these materials is that you want to have phase changes during the deformation because this aids you and helps you with the deformability. And what it basically does is, this is just a very fast, if you wish, snapshot, uh, that you can overcome the brittle, the, the relatively brittle behavior at room temperature uh, if you anneal the materials at higher temperatures. I hope you can see this, this kind of specimen here breaks in a pretty brittle fashion, more or less under 45 degrees with a lot of impact through shear banding. On the other hand, if you anneal the material at higher temperatures, then you see, okay, you have this typical barrel shape, which indicates that there is a lot of ductility in the material. So annealing usually is very helpful uh, to induce phase transformations, to induce some kind of ductility. Uh, this is something you can drive further if you basically combine this idea of creating uh, eutectic structures, eutectic compositions that I presented a while ago with a kind of high entropy alloy concept where you simply multiply the elements and the alloy, the overall alloy composition, then you can also create high entropy alloys with a dual phase microstructure. So for instance, then you simply can combine relatively ductile FCC phases plus BCC phases, which give you some additional strength. So this should roughly indicate, again, you can create dual phase high entropy alloys uh, with an intriguing microstructure that, again, shown here in this upper diagram, may undergo a really pronounced work hardening. This is in this specific alloy series here, these iron-based alloys, again, due to a drip effect where you simply have an FCC to BCC transformation during the term during the deformation. So the other, I would say, recipe that you can use is besides making the alloys more and more complex, that you also induce additional phase transformations that aid in terms of the work hardening that aim for increasing the ductility at the end of the day. This is in principle not a new concept. The thing that is new is that you can do this, of course, not just for conventional steels, let's say, but you can do it for a variety of relatively new and advanced high performance materials if you basically take what you know from the textbook and implement it to novel alloy systems. So I tried to show you in this very limited time that alloy design, tuning compositions, tuning metastable phases and structures is a, is a fascinating way to create more or less new materials, new structures with a relatively fine scale uh, microstructure at the end of the day. These could be single phase, these could, these could be dual phase, these could be multi-phase materials and composite structures that give you a lot of, a lot of interest in mechanical deformation behavior. Of course, what is necessary, what is still ongoing and what is needed is a much more quantitative analysis not just understanding the deformation mechanisms, but also to put this in a quantitative picture that at the end of the day, you have a tool to predict 
for a given alloy composition, for a given processing condition, uh, what kind of properties you may expect. And for this, we usually use a lot of machine learning at the moment to simply condense critical parameters out of the phase space and out of the processing conditions to finally, hopefully, have some kind of prediction capability. So I think altogether, this gives you a lot of opportunities for designing modern metallic materials. Uh, so in a, in a nutshell, I would say metallic alloy development is by far not at the end of the line. And of course, this is only possible if you can trust a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues all over the world. This is just a compilation of some names that are involved in one or the other way in this, in this kind of activities. And with this, I'm at the end of the talk. And thank you very much for listening. Just closing with some pictures of Leoben, a little town in the southern, southeastern part of Austria. Thank you very much for listening.